All right, thank you all so much for being here today. We are about to start the next track of the next session of track two. And today we're gonna to be hearing about um, design barriers for deaf and hard of hearing gamers uh, presented by Jasmine Granados. We also have a moderator here in chat that's helping us out, Trisco Gehaven. And so he's gonna be kind of making sure that we have questions, uh, people notice the questions, so please post those in the Q&A. And I believe Jasmine will be taking questions near the end of the talk. So whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and begin. All right, sounds great, thank you for that. Um, so my name is Jasmine and I'm a graduate student at Wichita State University. Um, I'm doing my docker right now and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but first, uh, we'll, let's dive into some design barriers for deaf and hard of hearing gamers. Um, as you can probably tell by the top topic of my talk, I'm really passionate about um, video games and also very passionate about accessibility. So we'll be talking about both. Um, so first thing that I wanna talk about is that disabilities are more common uh, than you think. In, in the United States, uh, there's one in four people who have a disability. Um, and for specifically talking about deaf or hard of hearing, there are 3.5 million people in the United States who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, so just to make sure we're on the same page, deaf refers to an individual with, with very little to uh, no functional hearing. And uh, hard of hearing refers to an individual who has mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, so they may only hear specific frequencies or sounds within a certain volume range. So now we're going to talk a little bit about video games um, in general um, and how popular they are. As you know, we have a whole conference of uh, dealing with video games, so it's pretty popular. In 2018, the Global uh, Games Market reports that 54% 50, of North Americans uh, adults played video games. That's a huge market, a $32.7 billion market. And that's only growing. So the most important part here is from 2017, 2018, it grew 10%. So it's saying that it's something that is continually growing and not, not going away. It's, it's only increasing. So one thing I want to hit on here is what the average gamer looks like. So you might think that the average gamer looks something like this, um, maybe even something like this. But in actuality, the average gamer looks like this something like this. So we have such a variety of gamers. And as I mentioned before, 65% of adult, uh, American adults play video games, and that's on a variety of different consoles. So we have smartphone, personal computer, and dedicated game consoles as well. So let's learn a little bit more about what uh, some stats on gamers. Um, so we have uh, the average gamer here is 30, uh, 33 years old. And splitting that by sex, it's pretty even. We have 46% of gamers being female and 54% being male. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to uh, point out here is that gamers have been playing on average for 14 years. So on, on 14 years on average. So that means that when people are playing games, they're really dedicated to it. They're playing it and they're committed and they're um, really fans <laughs> of, of uh, games. So they're not just picking up and going. Um, and games are social. So 63% of people play with others, and they do so for a good amount of time. 4.8% play uh, with others online, and 3.5% or hour, sorry, on average, uh, play with others in person. So people are playing with other people online and in person. Um, as well as, let's look at parents. So 57% of parents play games with their children. Um, and 74% believe that games are educational. So that just shows that the future of games is staying there. Parents have this positive perspective um, and video games are gonna stick around. So now I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about accessibility. So unfortunately, uh, we do not know the exact number of deaf and hard of hearing gamers uh, specifically, but if you combine how many deaf individuals there are um, and how many gamers there are, there are millions of people who aren't being considered um, in the design process. So what I wanna kind of talk about here is the difference between um, how they could be designed for. So equality, we see here on this image, everybody has the same thing. Everybody has that box they can stand on uh, 
stand on. But then we see accessibility is giving a little extra to the people who might need it, right? But universal design is the idea that we, from the beginning, we think and we consider everyone. So that's a, a all in all, it's a better way to approach um, when we're designing for anything, but specifically for games. Um, and it just makes a better experience for everyone. So uh, that's the idea of universal design. So what I'm um, going to talk a little bit about accessibility and universal design throughout this, so I wanted to clarify that. So today what I'm going to talk about is a study that I conducted um, with deaf and hard of hearing gamers. So I, um, I went and I interviewed uh, several different um, gamers and we'll talk about what we found out through that. So my goals for this study was to understand the deaf and hard of hearing gaming community. So I myself am not deaf or hard of hearing. So I wanted to make sure that if I wanted to, um, I wanted to understand what was going on in the community and actually talk to the people in that community, that's the best way to do it. Um, what problems does this community face and what accessibility tools are they currently using um, to help with those problems that they might be facing. So the, a little bit about the individuals that I interviewed. I interviewed eight individuals, five were males, two were female, one was non-binary. Uh, had an uh, age range of 22 to 44. Uh, six of these individuals were deaf and two were hard of hearing. Everyone played video games for at least four hours a day and they had, uh, I had a variety of PC and console gamers. So a little bit of all. Um, so you might be wondering, how do you interview uh, deaf or hard of hearing individuals? Well, I do, I personally do not know American Sign Language, so I was not able to use that method. Um, but what I ended up doing was sending an email, recruiting these people and using Discord. So many of you might be familiar with Discord, but gamers specific, specifically are very familiar with Discord and it's a comfortable place for them. So I interviewed through Discord and um, sent them questions live. So sent them questions while they were there and I got answers immediately back. It was very co comfortable because um, gamers are already used to chatting online. Um, and so it was very easy to get, you know, good answers from them, as well as they could send me links and things like that. Also, it automatically transcribes the interview for you, which is very nice. <laughs> so let's get into some of actually what I found. So the first kind of thing I wanted to talk about is why do these individuals play video games? Well, it turns out pretty similar reasons to everyone else, but um, one person said it's a solace of peace for them. It's a place where they can maintain friendships and relationships. And they actually picked it up really early in their life from their family, from their mom, uh, uncles, cousins, since they were very young. Another person said that games are pretty much their life. They work in games, they play in games. Um, so it's pretty much a, a central aspect of their life. So it seems pretty important. It's not just something that they just do kind of sometimes, it seems pretty important to them. The other thing I wanted to focus on here is I wanted to go through some of these key themes, these key problems that the community faced that kept, just kept getting brought up by multiple people. Um, so I'm gonna go through all of these individually. Um, so first we're gonna start with team communication. So team communication. Uh, so there, um, people talk to their friends there and sometimes they have a hard time doing so uh, because games don't allow them to do so. Um, so there's some way uh, if, sorry, if the game is only allows for voice, then that really limits them to be able to have that communication. So some of the other ways that games do it other than voice um, are that first image that I have here is Apex. Um, and that's called a ping system. So you, ping system means you can just basically point out something and it will call it out for you in game and let your um, teammates know about that enemy, about that object, about that weapon. Um, so that's one way you can do it. Um, Overwatch, I have two examples from Overwatch here. Uh, this middle one is what is in currently 
in Overwatch right now, which is a chat box, which a lot of other games have as well. But you also can send notifications like if you see in this, it says my ultimate's ready or charging. So you can let others know about your abilities and um, or make commands like group up with me, different things like that. But what Overwatch is uh, most recently implementing is it's an updated communication wheel. So you can add, you can say even more instead of having to type it in. So like examples on here is like fall back, or you can even have a countdown. So you all um, engage at once. So you can use these features to help communicate um, besides just using voice. So the next one I'm going to talk about is subtitles and closed captions. So um, before I get into the examples, I want to just clarify for people the difference between subtitles and closed captions. So closed captions are things that describe sound. Um, and I'll give you an example on the next slide, but it's describing sound and then subtitles are just dialogue uh, that's going on uh, in the conversation. So this was a really big issue for people. Um, the lack of subtitles for quote unquote less important dialogue uh, if you if you don't have that, they just feel like they're not being included in everything, like the conversations between NPCs, so non-playable characters. So a lot of the times these conversations are just um, flavor. So it's just for fun. There's not really information in there needed that's critical to complete um, the game, but it's fun and it adds to the characters and um, basically people want the option to have that, to hear that uh, that information. So let's look for, uh, let's look at examples of captions and subtitles. So that first one here, um, this first image is from Portal. Um, and we see here an example of a caption. So it says large wall panel movement. Um, that is describing a sound. So people are able to, to see that that's happening. Right under it, we have GLaDOS saying goodbye, Caroline. So uh, that is um, an example of a subtitle. So I want to go a little bit deeper because not all subtitles are made the same um, and show you two different other examples. So in the middle here, uh, well, both of these, we have examples from Assassin's Creed series. Um, this subtitle, you can see that it's going across a variety of different colors and textures. It's really hard to make that out. Um, to read that when it's on all those different colors and textures, a way that we can combat this is just by simply putting a transparent, um, a transparent box behind the dialogue and it makes it just pop out a little bit more and easier to read. Um, so there's kind of two examples there. So the last one we're talking about um, today is directional feedback. So directional feedback um, is sounds that and they're coming from a certain direction, but it might be hard to decipher exactly where. So it sounds like footsteps, gunshots, things like that. It's kind of critical to know where those are coming from. Well, this person stated, uh, there's games that they used to enjoy playing, but can't fully appreciate due to the strong focus on directional audio. And in the end, they just gave up playing it. They felt like they couldn't enjoy the game uh, because they could not understand you know, where sounds were coming from. So to give you kind of an example of one way that a game has tried to tackle that, um, I'm gonna show you example of Fortnite. Um, so they have a system that visualizes the sound, so it makes the sound visual. So here I have an example, um, if you see in the red box, there is an example of footsteps, so that's the white. It shows you where, that, where those footsteps are coming from. So they're coming from that room and then it also shows you an example of where the gunfire is coming from. So that's the orange kind of um, sporadic <laughs> line. So that goes as a wheel around the entire screen and allows the player to kind of understand where those sounds are coming from if they can't hear um, or if they have um, or they're hard of hearing. Be better able to play the game and enjoy the game. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about some of those tools that individuals uh, talked about using. So that first one right, right here, that's, a, that's called the sub pack. So I had a few uh, individuals actually talk about using a sub pack. It's a vest that you can wear and you actually feel sound. 
So it sends vibrations through the vests that go with the sound that's happening um, on the game. Um, but originally this wasn't just made for games. It's made for music and different things like that. Um, but there seems to be a use in games. So you can use it in VR. Um, but the player, the people that I've talked to actually used it to help with directional sound um, as well as to help with the atmosphere. So think about a game like a, a horror game where sound and music is very important and vital to playing the game, to experiencing the game. Um, if you can't hear the sound, that kind of takes away a lot of the enjoyment. So this really helps immerse them um, in the game and uh, experience it uh, more like, like they want to, right? And then the second thing is a headset. Um, so you might wonder why a deaf or hard of hearing individual would use a headset. Um, well, there's a variety of reasons. First one would be if, if they can hear any sound at all, they would like to utilize that sound. So there's that. But also there are some headphones that actually provide tactile feedback, uh, vibrate when certain sounds are happening. Um, so that would be very useful um, for individuals who would want that sort of feedback. Okay, so just as a kind of a um, reminder, those are the three things that we talked about, team communication, subtitles, and closed captions and directional feedback. Now I wanna just jump in um, a little bit to the future directions of what, what does this mean, right? So this research was done um, to help inform my dissertation topic. Um, so now that I know more about the community and the problems that they face, I can actually research something to help improve the accessibility of games. Um, and that was really important to me. I didn't want to just jump into my dissertation and research something that wasn't going to be impactful or important um, to this group of people. So I wanted to make sure I, I talked with them uh, and, and was able to see what are the real problems that they're facing. So a little bit about what I'm gonna do, and I'm in the process of proposing right now. Um, I wanna focus on the issue of directional feedback. Um, although the sub pack that we talked about seems promising, it's quite expensive. Um, and I want to explore a more accessible option for people. Um, so I wanna focus on tactical fe tactile feedback from a controller. So a controller is something that comes with the game system. So it's something that's already uh, with it and people have and something that can be utilized for this. Um, so what I'm thinking about doing is using uh, a third person shooter and having somebody use a controller. So one of the cues we would give them is tactile feedback on the right or left of the controller. So that would inform them which directions enemies are coming from, from their right or left as well as we'd have another condition that would use visual feedback. Um, and we'd have another condition that used both, a combination of the two and one that had no cues. So the idea here is to see which combination um, or them on their own, which one of the cues uh, has an increase in performance and also what do people prefer? Um, their preference, right? So <laughs> even if something results in an increase in performance, people might hate using it. And then we don't, we need to figure out why, right? So that's my two ideas there, trying to see what's going on, if this is um, an avenue that uh, would be beneficial, right? So the last thing I wanted to address um, is why I do this. This research needs to be continued because it's it's very important. It's vital, especially for people like I, who I have displayed here. Her name's Ewok. Um, she's a 14-year-old professional Fortnite player who actually happens to be deaf. Um, this research for my for my dissertation will help real people like her um, be able to do what she does for a living and does what she enjoys, right? So um, yeah. So that's the end of my presentation. I have some contact information here if you wanna contact me and I'd love to take questions.
And people can feel free to both post in the chat, post in the Q&A, or if anybody would like to um, speak their question, if that's easier, uh, you can also raise your hand and I can temporarily allow you to speak as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So you have a question from Nikki. Uh, she says, what prompted your focus on deaf, hard of hearing players over other disability categories, such as blind, low vision, mobile disabilities, et cetera? That's a really great question. Um, so there's so much research on, on uh, vision uh, that I felt that there was a lack uh, for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing, especially in games. Um, so that kind of made me focus uh, more on that area. Not that I'm not interested um, in the other areas, but also with mobile disabilities, there's a um, mobility, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, Xbox has the accessibility controller. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of research going on there as well. It's so important and it's really uh, interesting. I just thought uh, the, the disabilities that weren't being focused on, um, I wanted to to target those a little bit more. Thank you. And then Ollie West said, uh, it must be really hard to balance the visual for directional tools. I wonder if there's any concerns regarding players without hearing limitations, turning them on for competitive advantage. That's a great question. Um, so the idea here is you to, you to let it be available to everyone, right? So Fortnite's a good example. Uh, when Fortnite was made on the mobile, uh, application they did they created that um a visual display for mobile only so the idea was people were playing on uh, mobile without sound because you know you play in uh while you're waiting to be seated or um, in the waiting room for places you play on your phone so you don't use sound so that was originally developed for that not for an accessibility idea there uh specifically but when they were transferring, transferring it over to, to PC, to uh, console and PC, um, they were worried about that. But the idea is making it available for everyone and then everybody has an equal opportunity using those same systems. So it's not giving anybody a competitive edge, it's giving everybody the same tools um, to use, to utilize. Great, and then you have another question from Go Testify. They're saying, have you experienced pushback on effort uh, design changes from studios? That's a great question. Um, so the common thing that people will say about accessibility is that it dumbs down games. Um, that is not true at all. Um, it doesn't take away anything from games, it only adds. And the idea here is options. So let's take subtitles, for example. Not everybody uses subtitles but having the option for the people who need it is way it outweighs uh it's so much more beneficial than just not having it at all and as we see when we actually test the accessibility features people love it even people who don't necessarily need it they love to have the option so with subtitles for example when a uh, majority of people I, bl I don't remember the exact percentage um it's about like 86 percent or something like that leave it on um, when it's the default turned on. Um, so people actually, and when you ask people, they actually enjoy having it. So that's a really good, really good question. We have time for another if anybody wants to speak up. Otherwise, we can kind of uh, wrap it up and start sending up our next speakers. Oh, it looks like we did get one. Yeah, so Aram uh, is asking, are you planning on getting some of your ideas realized in student games collaboratively? Uh, yeah, so um, 
clarify with me if I'm wrong, but are you talking about like working with other students like creating games? Is that what you're asking? Okay, yeah, so um, for my dissertation, we're working on creating a game ourselves um, to utilize, to test these, this functionality. Hopefully it can be, you know, provided to mainstream, but in the idea of, of collaborating with um, like the, the game developing uh, side at Wichita State, I would love to do that. And I've reached out a few times, um, but I haven't gotten anybody to, be uh, especially interested. Um, so that's de definitely an avenue I'm willing to do. I would love to, um, to work with people and, you know, give my, my uh, opinion um, based on the research I've done on what they can do to Im improve accessibility. I guess the top recommendation I would give would to be actually get people involved uh, who have accessibilities and play tests with them um, and see what they think about the game and what they think could be added. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate the positive feedback and please um, feel free to reach out, uh, email, send an email, send a tweet um, if, you, if anybody has questions or interests. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.